Margaret awoke, startled, a cold sweat clinging to her. She gathered her thoughts. Aged wood creaked, echoing through the quiet rooms. Near the house stood a shrine to Rhea Dana, goddess and daughter of the land, of Rhea and a being of comfort. Margaret sought answers. But the goddess did not speak. There was only the faint whisper of something dark, something hungry. The old seer's bones felt the weight of their age as she climbed. The only thought on her mind has it begun again? John's mission would be a simple one. He was to investigate Rhea's greatest shrine. His mother presented him with a fresh divinity shard. From his brother came a newly sharpened sword. His wife gave him a kiss and his daughter's hugs were full of reason to return home safe. It first appeared as sludge given life, slithering creatures, small and vile. Before him was sacred ground, left untouched in days gone by. Remaining calm and collected, the shock of his heart skipping beats was concealed in expert fashion. Before him stood Linda, his eldest daughter, with bow and quiver at the ready, determined to do her part. Before the Guardians were not beasts feeding, but monsters consuming, destroying others, they corrupted and distorted, creating even more hungry husks. Both father and daughter gathered their thoughts, their hearts heavier than before. How would they explain what they had witnessed? The ancient tree had been cut down. Together, father and daughter described the horror, the creatures dripping with decay that slithered into bodies stuck between life and death to bolster their ranks. Grandma Margaret confirmed what they all feared. It was the corruption. A cruel entity spoken of only with hushed voices. An ocean of darkness that flowed from the top of Mount Morta. And the Bergson's duty was to stand against this devouring deluge of death. John steeled his nerves thinking of the difficult climb ahead of him and his daughter. The only thought that consumed his mind by all the curses. Where is that boy right now? Kevin was also eager to do his part in the family's fight. Especially when his older brother Mark was off somewhere. He was as much a guardian of their mountain home as any of them. 
she stood. If they were to reach the summit and destroy this evil, as the Bergsons of old had done in the past, they would need the assistance of the sanctuary. Given to the Bergsons by Rhea herself, the sanctuary was a gateway to the mysterious lands around the mountain. Margaret pointed to the huge crystal at the center of the den, revealing their next task, to activate it and open the way to the source of the corruption. And once Rhea's three spirits are gathered on the grounds, the only gate to the top of Mount Morta will open in this chamber. By himself, or with the assistance of those who loved him, John needed to gather the three spirits from their lands. Without them, he would not be able to stem the flow of the corruption. Love, truly a divine emotion, especially during dark days. Love had motivated this mother to lay down her life for her cub. While love now compelled the young one to try and rouse her from eternal slumber. And it would be love welcoming the new orphan among the Bergsons. All eight eyes studied the one so willing to walk into their own tomb. The creature howled in anguish as death slowly beckoned to bestow its peace. The Bergson could go no further. The path blocked. The life crystal, as if filled to the brim with life, started to pulse. A way had opened, a step closer to the spirit at the heart of the caves, though before taking that step, caution dictated a return to home to inform the family of the newfound passage. They gasped for air as the celestial shard brought them back, a sensation no hero could become accustomed to. Defeated, the Spider King had been removed from the path leading to the halls of Anaya Dyer. Although the pestering of greedy goblins might still prove dangerous along the way, Uncle Ben was pointing out possible routes forward, speaking of the troubles pilgrims had run into in the lost trenches. Kevin returned from his saga with barely a scratch, yet he found no appreciation from his family, especially his father. Despite having Linda on his side, his father was still mad at him for endangering himself and worrying them all, including his pregnant mother. His favorite line asking how he could be so inconsiderate. He wondered whether Uncle Ben would understand his bravery and initiative better. With his heroic act unrecognized, the young boy waited, frustrated, expecting more punishment. What Kevin had not expected was his parents' reaction. Heartened by his courage, his father was going to teach him the ways of battle, and his mother was far from the frail and always worried housewife she had seemed. 
a Bergson through and through, she gave him her blessing and asked only that he temper his courage with caution. Perhaps Uncle Ben was the happiest of them all. Not only had his nephew held his own in combat, but had done so with the weapons he had made for him. Kevin only wished his older brother Mark was there to witness his rise to the family calling. Although in the safety of the Bergson's house, the young cub was not yet free from danger. Exhaustion racked the animal's body, its chest heaving for even the smallest of breaths. The family believed several plants found deep in the nearby caves, combined together, could serve to remedy the situation. As the conversation turned to the progress of the corruption, Mary was curious to know which village had been attacked this time. However, that worry gave way to panic when Lucy entered. Poor beasts, all slaughtered. Maybe something had infected them. The corruption was on their doorstep now. The goblin bandits had been preying on Anaya Dias pilgrims with unprecedented cruelty, removing the evil to help those who had taken refuge in the cave. Ben had heard that the goblin sibling's lair was somewhere in the lost trenches. Berksons had to deal with those two as soon as they could. The creature that now threatened the hero was a crudely focused inferno of hatred and malice. If one raging beast was not enough, then surely two were. Letting out a final rasping breath, the second beast became motionless. The poor creatures twisted by the corruption, were finally able to rest. A path to be cleared of the corruption and the jewel of life to be restored, the realm of Anea Dia, mother of beasts and the goddess of waters. Before embarking for the spirit halls, however, the family must be informed of the newly opened passage. The goblin siblings lay dead, and the pilgrims were now safer in their caves. But the last step remained to be taken. The warriors knew only that somewhere in the expanse of the caves was the ancient halls of the spirit who would reveal new truths to them. Mark was out of the woods now. His fever gone, he was almost up and about. Welcome back, brother, said Kevin. He had avoided conflict over the years, living in harmony with nature. But as Uncle Ben was fond of saying, a Bergson would forget how to walk before they forget how to fight.
Panea Daya, the mother of beasts and goddess of anguish, a protector, a being of stone made living. Finally free of the corruption's hold, Anea Dyer gazed upon the Bergson, her emerald eyes weary with exhaustion. The spirit's words took life, forming images to reveal what was hidden from the Bergsons. And us, spirits three, knelt before the mountain god U to swear fealty. Our wills were set on peace, his were set on testing ours. And as the test drew to a close, we discovered our wretched ending as the mountain god exacted vengeance on the children of Rhea Dana and tainted Rhea with the corruption. Thus was another truth revealed to the Bergson, but many more were hidden still. Questions were abundant in the Bergson's minds. If the mountain god was the source of the corruption, what had made him wreak such havoc? How had no one known about him before? They needed to find the next spirit, as maybe they had an answer to some of their questions. More truths awaited them in the land of the winds. Fire child was ready. As if night had become day, the cub showed no signs of its past struggles with Lucy and he now simply dancing the day away. If the little wolf cub was to stay, it would need a room and bed of its own. All too happy to build it, Ben only required some wood and nails from nearby. Nai Raha, the spirit of fealty, awaited the Bergsons somewhere in Berahat. Next portal, take the warriors there.
Sometimes, just as you're getting ready to leave, someone arrives and you stay for them forever. Sheila's ring drew Ben's attention. The same ring that Sheila had always said belonged to her firstborn. This man was their son. Ben could not stop staring into Joey's eyes, the eyes that he had gotten from Sheila. When Joey informed his father of the many years since his mother's passing, Ben's heart felt cold. In that single moment, with the single gulp he drank, the memory of all the years with her passed through his mind. Regret became his companion then. It was not the warmth of the drink, but his son's touch that brought him out of the coldness within. Sheila was dead, but their son was here. And this was the future. A future they had to build now, together. Joey was ready to fight alongside the other Bergsons to clear a road to that future. The manipulator of the disenfranchised, the leader of rats, with fingers sharp as daggers and a soul lacking its humanity. The truth was, no one chooses the life of a thief. The crystal was calling the hero back, through a path opened anew from the sacred city of Anai Raha, the spirit of wind and weather. The Bergson felt a strange weariness as home beckoned. The chamber groaned and trembled, darkness replacing light. Above, the family waited to eat, comfort replacing vigilance. Snatched, gone. Dread replacing happiness. One body was taken, but two souls were in need of rescue. Somewhere out there, surrounded by the darkness, Mary and her unborn child lay in need. The Bergsons would find them.
gluttonous and ravenous, it seized the lesser creature and took it into itself. Move, the Guardian thought, for there was no time to waste. There they were. The creature roared, but flight was no longer on the hero's mind. The Bergson now stood their ground, ready to take action. Disbelief was not a strong enough word, and denial was not a luxury they could afford. They knew all too well that Grandma Margaret was gone. A hero may fade, but they never disappear. Their actions left to echo through an eternity, carried by those lives they touched. No one could believe that Grandma Margaret had passed away. The Bergsons shed their tears, hearts filled with sorrow. Ben and John were shocked to their core. The letter left by their mother spoke of a terrible secret, the one way to stop the corruption. The only way, she claimed, was to sacrifice their soon-to-be-born child to U, the god of Mount Morta. It was unthinkable. Perhaps their mother had made a mistake, had somehow misinterpreted the signs and ciphers. John thought they should keep the letter a secret for now. Two people one old and one young surely did not belong in the clearing of windswept sand. The older was nervous, looked at his surroundings as if for the first time, but an air of wisdom still lingered around him. They were on the run and in search of one more able-bodied than themselves. For a monstrous and savage creature had begun to dwell near the observatory. The creature that now threatened the hero was a crudely focused inferno of hatred and malice. With the observatory now safe from the belligerent beast, the two were once again free to observe the heavens. Ane Raha, the god of the free wind, now tethered to the ground. His voice to the people is now just the warden of his prison. Oh, wow. 
The air touched him, filling him and ruffling his feathers. He looked upon the Bergson, small and fragile, but so full of hope. Infectious hope. Perhaps this would be the last time. The spirit's words took life, forming images to reveal what was hidden from the Bergsons. And so it was their fate to do battle, the children of Rhea Dana on the cusp of victory would find their world overrun with the corrupted drowning them. And when they could fight no more, they would bow to Ooze demand. For there was no salvation in fighting his corruption. By giving a heart-wrenching sacrifice, they would stay the gods' thirst for mere centuries. But Ooze vengeance would fall upon the world again, with still more cruelty and malice. Thus was another truth revealed to the Bergsons, but there was still more hidden. The children of Rhea Dana, the Bergsons' destiny, and how much of it Grandma had found out before her demise were the subject of much speculation among the family. Speculation without certainty. When Linda told them about Mary's deterioration, they knew they had to do something to prevent another catastrophe. Mark tried to help with his knowledge of herbs he knew that somewhere around Berahat was a tree, and an extract of its seeds might help stop Mary's chills and fever. But Berahat had surrendered to the corruption, and not even the trees were safe from it. The old man explained that yesterday's secrets and even tomorrow's legends can be found written in the stars. Unfortunately, an eyeglass broken in yesterday's haste would not allow vision into tomorrow's unknown. The sage looked upon the Bergson for help. The nearby mines could luckily supply the materials needed to craft a new lens. All the young boy would need was someone to watch over him while he gathered. With the eyeglass replaced, the two turned back to the heavens, tomorrow's legend resting beyond the horizon while yesterday's secrets hid nearby. The tree of prosperity was withered after twisting away from Rhea's will. The spirit cracked as bark splintered and left behind the seed that the Bergsons were looking for. 
No time to waste. Mary was waiting. A sip of the potion was enough for Mary to open her eyes and for John to exhale with relief. Unbidden, pain shot up Mary's spine and filled her eyes. Something other than her illness. The baby was coming. It was time. The air was suddenly still. Mary's sickness had made them forget that the ravenous mountain god was after their baby. Curses! Black altar had come alive with an ominous will. Even Rhea's light couldn't keep it at bay, couldn't delay the evil of the sacrifice forced upon them. When John held her for the very first time, she was crying the song of life. Life was all that went through her father's mind. How he wished that he could give his own life instead of his baby's. But his life was worthless to the cruel god. Mary burst into tears. She feared that John was going to give up their baby to save the world. A world that at this moment was worth nothing at all to her. What chance did the Bergsons have against this monstrous cruelty of an immortal god? What a rotten fate that had doomed them to this destiny. How could John accept this heinous cycle of looming apocalypse and child sacrifice? His whole body shook from the conflict inside him. Every glance from his family was like a mortal wound to his heart. Would they let hope Die this day? This could not be the end. No. Grandma had already sacrificed herself for them. There would be no more sacrifices. Together, they were going to break that cycle and defeat unjust fate and the look in their eyes became one of resolve for life, for hope. It was laughing and shaking the small girl, just like any other bully. And a Bergson knows how to deal with bullies. With the common foe defeated, the little automaton's trust was earned. Dust and decay hung in the stale air. The man sat motionless. The 
the machine called out, but the silence could not reply. Nothing remained for the little automaton in the hollow room. It was all alone. Years continued to crank on in the distance, for the city must survive. Now, even more soulless than before, without life, and as if none had ever existed within the gears, and a new road forward opened with the jewel of life. The Berkson stood at the gates of Anai Sarava, but caution dictated going back and informing the others. Were they cursed? The more they moved ahead, the more the corruption came forth. Blocked from light, everything with us. The Bergsons wondered what dangers could lie ahead still. She did not speak, just sat there in silent sorrow. And try as they might, the family could not console the little automaton. The darkness threatened to overwhelm them, but they needed to unshackle the last spirit as soon as possible. To the Bergson's surprise, the enemy of their enemy was only another small automaton. The same human grief clung to this little one as it did the one back home. A coincidence, it was not. Ane Sarava, the architect of Teralava, and the creator of Jin, a machine meant to serve the land, not oppress it. The air became aggressive, the temperature rising as energy returned to the Mighty One and flowed through his veins. Ane Sarava was free again. As the spirit gazed upon the family, he felt something different, something unusual. Perhaps this could indeed be the final cycle. The spirit's words took life, forming images to reveal what was hidden from the Bergsons. Excitement filled the empty space. The promise made was now a promise fulfilled. The rock appeared on the horizon and the boundless wander ended. Journey had met destination and the vagabond son of the heavens became the mountain god.
His heart skipped. His mind echoed with music. His breath caught when the daughter of Rhea stole his heart and carved it with her name, Rhea Dana. Two became a pair, mates joined in happiness, who willed to elevate Rhea's creatures from her wisdom. Three spirits were created to guard the eons. And they lived a thousand years in bliss until Rhea Dana bore him a daughter. The mountain god could not stand her as he envied the child. Furious, he raged at Rhea Dana and she left him. He wore the grudge as if it were a crown, one made of corruption. Cursing the name of Rhea Dana's daughter, he descended into resentment. Thus was the truth revealed to the Bergsons, and the origin of the corruption. The two little automatons were surely connected. But another was yet to be found. Their final destination was on the other side of that gate. The ending was nigh. On the throne, the mountain god Ū himself, without Rhea Dana's love, the darkness had swollen inside him, consuming and uncontainable. Heavy as iron and difficult to breathe in, the air burned their lungs. It was pitch black. The light meant protection and hope. And the Bergson had to rescue the others as well. The darkness weighed heavily upon the hero who knew that these final steps were to be taken shoulder to shoulder. The Bergsons knew that this was the final step. Love must prevail over hatred. The Supreme One, Master of All and Master of Nothing. 
His greatest fear was made absolute. He was left alone. Left alone to his misery and failure, to the unending cycle of despair and pain. He wished for its end, wished to bathe in an eternal darkness. Mercy prevailed as the wheel had turned back to kindness. That which was expelled from the heart returned. All the time apart, melting away, along with all the pain, all the sadness, and all the misery. Land met sky, two became one. Love ignited rapture as innocence flooded the space between breaths. Happiness and curiosity weaved, mixed and tangled in a dance a millennium in coming. One ascended, but will never leave. A family looked upon the mountain and land over which they were given ward. A family left exhausted was now more complete than before. A god once stricken with grief was now whole. And a land once cast into chaos is now left in serene balance. As the story comes to its conclusion, remember this. When the time spent in this land is looked back upon, when daring feats are recited along with victories and defeats, Remember that it was not a tale of heroes or villains, nor of good and evil, but one of family, and above all else, a tale of love. Go now, Guardian, and never forget.